Nipun Mehta is the founder of Service Space, an incubator of projects that work at the intersection of volunteerism, technology and gift economy. What started as an experiment with four friends in the Silicon Valley has now grown to over 400,000 members who provide millions of dollars of service for free. Welcome, Nipun. In your articles and articles about you, it's mentioned that you had a paper route as a kid. <laughs> um, it sounds like any normal American guy going around on weekends delivering newspapers to make uh, some extra money on the side so you could buy something different, something extra for yourself. Um, sounds pretty normal to me. Yeah. What happened? <laughs> Um, yeah, no, paper route was great. Um, I learned a lot. Um, but I think there was there were probably two drives in me. One was the traditional drive where you do all the normal things, quote unquote normal things. And underneath it was a spiritual drive. And it was asking deeper questions like what is the purpose of life? You know, or do you just get a few things and then, you know, you die? He who dies with the most toys still dies, you know. I mean, so what's the purpose? Uh, and I think there were these existential questions that were driving me early on, but they were kind of in the background. And at one point, uh, I would probably say in my 17th year, uh, is when the background questions became the foreground and the dominant story sort of went into the background. Was there anything that happened uh, when you were 17 years of age that made you shift from, from uh, you know, being a paper boy, uh, making side income and, and trying to buy something extra for yourself? and moving to being very deep about life and thinking about reason behind, beyond uh, making money on the side. I, mean, I think for me it was, there were, there were certainly peak moments. Um, you know, there were times where you know, I'd just be walking down the street and I see a limping man trying to get on the bus and he's going to miss the bus. And right. I would just like sit down and I just had this intense feeling of, oh, I wish I could just give him my legs, you know? I mean, it's not, it doesn't sound very rational, but that was the feeling that, wow, I wish I could give him all that I had so he can make his bus. Um, and so I would have these, you know, these moments of very deep connection. How old were you when you started to have moments like that? Um, I, think, I think growing up, I would have them. I probably didn't know how to process them in right. that way. Uh, but I think it was in my college years that I really started processing them uh, in, in a way of like saying, wow, you know, that is actually more normal. Uh, and the rest of what we call normal, uh, yeah. it, it, it seems like it's a little bit off tune, you know. So it's like when you're deeply connected to life, there's a sense of uh, interconnectedness that is very profound and very real. And I think compassion arises from that. And so I think growing up, I had all these different experiences, um, but it wasn't until I started serving other people that I realized that that is actually a very native experience. Like you can actually be like that all the time. Uh, if you practice. Yeah. But still, uh, looking at how kids grow up in, in most parts of the world, in the U.S. especially where you grew up uh, also, yeah. um, it's hard to find a 17-year-old boy who, who goes beyond thinking, what I want for the day, what, what, how can I get my next uh, bottle of Coke and things <laughs> like that. And, that yet, and then there you were, being very deep in thought, thinking about the sufferings of others on the street that you came across. What was it about your upbringing, Nipun, that caused you to be so concerned about others at the point in your life? I, I would have to give credit to my parents. Um, and in a way, the, it's a very different kind of credit because what they, it wasn't so much what they did, it was what they didn't do. You know, For that, example? So they said that here's your sandbox. And there are limits, you know, there's boundaries to the sandbox, but within the sandbox, you get to do whatever you want. And I think that allowing me to experiment in the constraints of those sandbox, right. I think just let me really find who I am. And it wasn't contextual. It wasn't dependent on whether I'm living at home or whether I'm staying at college or whether I have exposure to money or whether I have exposure to these things. Right. It was like, I really found myself and they gave me the space to do that. By not intervening, they allowed me to really find myself. Um, and so I really think that my parents gave me that huge gift, you know, by allowing me to really explore in my own way, uh, even though it was challenging at times. You know, I, I grew up in the dot-com world and, right. and, you know, imagine a young 20-something, you know, graduating from UC Berkeley and, you know, immigrant parents saying, wow, this guy's going to make it. 
Um, and then the kid comes home and says, uh, Mom, you know, I've decided I just want to uh, volunteer for full time, you know. How did they react to that? <laughs> um, they, I mean, I, you know, my mom and dad both had different responses. Okay. My mom's response was, you know, go out, make money, and then do whatever you have sure. to do. Yes. Um, and my, my dad was saying, you know, he just wanted to make sure that I was uh, very, um, it, it wasn't going to be like, a, you know, getting another skateboard or a guitar, and then you forget about it, and it stays in the garage. Um, and so both of them had their concerns. Um, but, you know, once I convinced them that, like, look, this is, this is a very real part of me, uh, they were like, okay, you know. Uh, it took a while to get them on board, uh, but I was very committed to getting them on board because they just want my best, you know, they, they just wish for my best. Very good. Um, as a child, you were, you were brought up in, in a city called Ahmedabad in India. Yeah. And that also happens to be a place where Gandhi is yeah. a special. Is yeah. it, that's right, right? Yeah. Did, did you, as a child, uh, somehow, one way or another, bought into the Gandhi story or you absorbed some of his values? Uh, I don't know. How, how was it? Could you... uh, yeah, I mean, Ga Gandhi certainly, I feel very connected to Gandhi. Mm -hmm. I'm not a Gandhian scholar by any means, but I'll still go up to scholars sometimes and be like, no, no, I think Gandhi meant this. I feel like I have an intuitive sense of what he was seeking. Um, and I think what we're all fundamentally seeking. But growing up in India, in India, there's Gandhi is a very controversial figure. You know, I mean, we've scandalized him, we've romanticized him, we've, you know, turned him into like, you know, there's the Gandhians and then the not Gandhians. And I don't know if Gandhi would be for all that, you know. Um, but I think having that distance growing up in the U.S. almost gave me the capacity to view Gandhi from a broader lens. And as I saw Gandhi, I was like, wow, what this guy's talking about is more relevant today than, than even during his time. You know, he warned about all the consequences of, uh, of a very different kind of design, different kind of path that we are on as a culture. So you're saying that Gandhi's teachings will still be relevant today in the time that we live now? Absolutely. I mean, he was talking about simplicity. Uh, he was talking about service. He was talking about stillness. And these are all things we, you know, in our consumeristic culture, if we can find simplicity, we would be able to see what's going on inside and we'd be nourished in a very different way. Um, I think if we were able to serve other people, we would not have the kind of inequities. We are inequities today, unprecedented. Um, and that stillness, you know, everyone's got, you know, usually when you go to a restaurant, no matter which country now, you know, it's like people are, they don't even know how to be still with, uh, with the other person, how to listen, how to pay attention. You know, they're like constantly gauging, oh, can I get like some other feedback? You know, can I check my phone? I've got this music playing, these stocks, who knows what else is going on? Text messages, you know, so uh, I think those fundamental things that Gandhi was talking about, uh, are even more relevant now than, uh, than ever before, I would say. Do you think his strategy of passive resistance or non-violent resistance is still uh, workable today? Absolutely. I think it takes on a different form. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, I, see, there's, there's different kinds of ways to understand Gandhi. I mean, there's the strategic way to do it. So there's, Gandhi was not a strategic non-violence person. He was a principled non-violence practitioner. Uh, so he didn't say, I want to use nonviolence as a strategy to get my way. Okay. So he would say, if we are fasting, if we are protesting, and those guys are out of town, let's not do it then. Let's do it when they are there. Let's not try to sneak something in so we can get ahead. It's not a strategic move. Right? If he wanted to, there's 100,000 British soldiers in India at the time of Gandhi. And, right. and you know, you have less than a billion people, but it's still an incredible number of people. You can really do all kinds of things, you know, nonviolently, but that's not what Gandhi wanted. In, fe in February 1922, Gandhi says uh, there was this incident at Chori Chori. Gandhi, of course, being this apostle of nonviolence, and there were all these, you know, people protesting in a nonviolent way. The police come. And the altercations, you know, it, things get a little bit antsy. And all, all the protesters are like, man, we are way bigger than them in numbers. Let's just like steamroll over them. Mm. And more than 20 people died. Gandhi's response to that, country is not ready for independence. This is 25 years before. He halted the whole movement. He says, the country is not ready for independence if we're going to act like that. So he was not using nonviolence as a strategy to get ahead. It's not like a business move where we can like sneak something in so we can get what we want. Right. He is saying, man, the other and me are one. And 
in that process, let us elevate both to a new plateau. Right? It's not the British. He would give gifts to the guy who's like the head of the British Army in South Africa, General Schmutz. You know, he gave, right, yeah. he made, he handmade sandals, and this is the guy who was like trying to make his life miserable. Right? And at the end, General Schmutz says, "There's a very powerful quote." He says that you know the uh, it was my honor. This is his chief opponent in South Africa before he went to India. It was my honor to have a person like Gandhi as my antagonist. Right? So that spirit, I think, is really uh, lacking in our in our in our world. You know, to say movement of the hundred percent. Like, it's not me versus this, or how do I get use my strategies to convince the other person of my view. It's that, wow, how do we elevate the whole movement to a different plateau? Wow. Wow. Excellent. Now, I know you've been asked this question many, many times before, but I'm going to ask you again. Could you tell me the story behind how uh, Service Space get started, got started? <laughs> Well, I think for us, in, in that small way, was that we wanted to explore this heart. Right? How do we love? How do we give with no strings attached? Yes. And so we didn't know early in our 20s, you know, and this was Silicon Valley. Like people are getting sign-in bonuses, and like you know, as it, like you you can't believe the outrageousness that was in the Silicon Valley at the time. And it just seemed like it was this very fast-paced train, but it was going on a dead end, you know. And so few of us said, well, how can we, you know, use the same spirit of creativity and energy and enthusiasm and innovation, but apply it for selfless purposes? Yes. Um, but we didn't know how, but we had a heart. And so we said, let's go. Where do we go? Well, we knocked, you know, we knocked on a few doors of people who were helping other people. Sure. Uh, and we said, how can we help you so that your help is even better? So we went to a homeless shelter back in 1999. And we ended up, uh, we said, you know, we've got two hands, uh, we've got two eyes, one big heart, you know, uh, what can Let's we do? Work. Yeah, exactly. And we ended up building them a website. Wow. Which at that time was very, you know, they didn't even know what a website was. Uh, very early days of the internet. That's right. And uh, we came back and we said, that was amazing. Let's do it again. And the amazing part about it wasn't the websites. It wasn't the technology. It was the giving. And that became the cornerstone of everything that we were doing, that let's provide meaningful opportunities for people to practice giving. And you, lo and behold, hundreds of thousands of people responded to the call and said, I want to be engaged in that kind of a movement, uh, a movement that goes from me to we, right? that, is, that honors the whole, um, that honors the collective. How did Karma Kitchen came to be? <laughs> Karma Kitchen was another one of those projects, right. you know. So I think we would do a lot of stuff online. Uh, then we would do a lot of online stuff that would ripple offline. And then there was uh, stuff that was purely on offline. And so we were at a meeting um, and uh, we said, you know, how about we talk about small acts of kindness. That's right. And when small acts of kindness get connected in a circle, it creates a very different energy. You know, I do something for you, you do something for someone else, that person for that other person, and together, like the guy behind me does it for me, you know? So it's not a transaction, but it's a circular way of, you know, taking, taking care of each other's needs. And so he said, how about we show that? Like, what if we just go take on a restaurant and we make the check be zero? And then we ask everyone to pay forward for people after them, whatever they're moved to offer. So every, you know, some people are probably thinking, oh, wait, wait, wait that can't work because people are selfish, you know, and they're just going to take and they're not going to give back. Um, but lo and behold, uh, we said, well, what do we got to lose? You know, let's go rent a restaurant. And so we did. And uh, then we ran the whole restaurant. We did all the dishes and the waiting tables and everything. And we put all kinds of beautiful ambiance that evoked a sense of empathy. Um, and we said, let's see, you know, if it fails at the end of the day, Look, you get a bunch of kids that tried to be generous, recklessly generous. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. How so what? That yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how many uh, restaurants do you have now, Karma Kitchen? It's, so Karma Kitchen essentially takes out, so there, they can be one days, mm -hmm. uh, one day a month. It could be one day a week. It could be seven days a week. In India, we run one that's, you know, full time. Uh, but they've probably been experimented in more than a dozen cities around the world. And I heard you've opened one in Jakarta recently. Is that, is that right? Yeah, there was one in Indonesia. Um, there's one coming up in Malaysia. In Malaysia also. 
There's one in Japan. Uh, there's one coming up in Europe. Uh, certainly, there's many in India, many in the United States. Excellent. Um, and, you know, people are just saying, wow, you know, we can relate to each other in a very different way. Like, it doesn't need to be transactional. Um, it can be trust-driven. And I think that's the possibility. And people are applying it to all kinds. There's a rickshaw driver in India that runs his rickshaw on a paid-forward basis. Wow. Whereas usually you would say, oh, these rickshaw drivers, they've like lost it. You know, they just take you, you tell them to go from point A to point B and they just take you some other place. And then you come home and you're like, oh, the ethics of this country has gone down. That's right. But if you actually live with them, you know, and I have, and you realize, look, they have a very small place. They all sleep outside. This is their shared space. And that rickshaw driver has got dreams for his kids too. And he's just, getting, he's just getting shortchanged by the whole system. And so when he sees a tourist or when he sees someone not familiar, he says, wow, this is the only way my kids are going to get a chance. And so you say, okay, well, both sides have a legitimate point. How are you going to break the stalemate? This rickshaw driver said, you know what? No meters in my rickshaw. I believe that you will respond to love. And I'm going to make that. I'm going to have my livelihood be dependent on that response, on that faith in you. And people sit in his rickshaw and they say, how, how much? This is your ride was paid for by someone before you. And you get to pay forward whatever you want for people after you. And people cannot believe it. This is not Bill Gates doing an act of generosity. This is a rickshaw driver in India. And they go up to him and they say, which organization? Who's doing this? And they're like, no organization. I just think I can do this on, I'm just counting. I mean, instead of like doing transaction, I'm paying it forward. That breaks that cycle between, oh, corrupt rickshaw drivers, ethics of the country have gone down. What are we going to do? These guys being the change in such a deep way, it starts to change everything. You know, like that, there's a clinic and there's a magazine and so many ways to, you know, uh, do, the, do our work in the world, um, but in a very different way with heart. In, one, in your speech at the Harker's graduation ceremony, let me quote one line that I have, it, I have written down here for you. Uh, greed is a calculated afterthought. <laughs> Could you explain about that a little bit? I, I think generosity is more natural. Um, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think when we are confused and disconnected, then it seems like we, we, the fear takes over us. And in that fear, we try to protect and accumulate. We, if you look at nature, nature, you know, no birds have bank accounts. If you look at how we were for nine months as we came into this world, we didn't have a five-year plan, you know, and we were taken care of. We got this far. And it tends to, so when we lose that connection with who we are and with how we are interrelated with other people, right. then we start to have fear. And when we start to have fear, we're no longer in the flow of the river. You know, it's like taking a bucket out of, uh, out of a stream of flowing river and saying, oh, this is my world. And then you have all these different problems because it's no longer flowing. Um, so I think as you get into that flow, as you immerse yourself into the flow of life, then I think it's very natural to be interconnected. And that interconnection is the basis of our security. Right. Our security is not going to come from banks. Our security is not going to come from money. Money as a legal tender is a very new technology. Right? And life has been around for a lot longer. Um, and so that, all, all that fear we, is, a, is a symptom of our disconnection. And I think generosity and service is a lever to reconnect. And when we reconnect, our security is in those deep ties that we experience with all life. How do we, I, I'm with you, I, I'm, I'm totally with you, but how do we apply this belief in a very corporate environment in Nippon? For example, in a corporate environment, a person has got, a typical manager has got what we call the key performance indicators, right? Yeah. It's very <laughs> KPIs. <per> it's KPIs. <laughs> it is a bad word for some people, it's a necessity for most others. You know, it, it's very focused on the person, on the job, and I've got my KPI, you've got your KPI, you work on yours and I work on mine. <laughs> there is a serious disconnect right there. Sure. How do we apply this belief in a very corporate setting like that? What do you think? I, you know, there, there's been a lot of research on how you change an ecology, how you change a group of people that are interconnected, That's whether right. in a corporate setting or whether in a social setting or whether in a volunteer setting. Um, we, uh, essentially, when we get connected, if people can become very selfish and say, me and mine first, mm -hmm. right? you can do this. 
it's not just your company. It's like two business partners can say, oh, this is where the boundary is. I want more than you, you know? So as soon as we start to build those barriers, um, you lose something, you lose trust, you lose that mutuality, you lose that co-creative possibility. Um, and productivity also goes down. Right? So how do you inculcate all of those settings with, you know, with, how do you infuse them That's right. yeah. with the generosity, with this higher trust, with this in turn greater productivity? And I think the response is, uh, there was a, actually, it, it was, there was a term phrased, uh, it was called consistent contributors. So at Kellogg uh, Business School, they did this research and they said, how do we change people who are kind of on the borderline, right? Who are saying, maybe I'll be nice if you're nice, you know? But, you know, I may not be nice if you're not nice. You know, I'm going to put up a boundary. How do you change an ecology to tend towards more generosity? And they realized that just having one consistent contributor in a group of people will change everyone towards greater generosity, towards greater trust. And in turn, they were measuring productivity. So having consistent contributors, right, people who say, look, I'm just going to be kind no matter what. I'm going to be in this group. I'm going to support people. You know, and there are so many examples like that. There's a guy in the Silicon Valley who says, if you have a request, he's one of these, uh, Adam Rifkin, he's one of these venture capitalists. He says, you want my time. If you can manage it in five minutes, I'll give, I'll give anyone five minutes. You know, and that's being generous with his time. You know, and and so you have many people that express uh, different ways of doing that. But I think what we need are consistent contributors. So one consistent contributor can change a whole group. So if one person comes out and says, "Look, instead of just checking in and saying how's the weather, what if at the end of every meeting we take a smile deck card?" Right? Each card has a unique kindness idea. And you pick a card and you go home, you do that act, and next time, it's, it's a very small thing. But you do that act, and next time you come back, instead of saying how the weather was, you say, look, this is what I did for that person down the street. You know? And that made me feel great. And as soon as you bring that ethos into it, other people start to, you know, their conversations change, the way they connect starts to change. You, it's not just one dimensional, this is my boss, or this is my subordinate, and this is how I treat them. You start to invite whole uh, people and whole interactions. So I think it's possible everywhere. Um, and I think it starts by inspired givers saying, I will be that consistent contributor in my group, in my setting, in my city, in my uh, you know, country. Yeah. I'm sure there are people when, when, when they hear the good stuff that you're doing would go, I don't think this guy's for real. I mean, oh, 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 he hasn't he hasn't let the cat out of the bag yet. Yeah. Are you real, Nippon? How do you respond to that question? Are That's you for it. real, man? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the thing is, I not only am I for real, we're all for real, okay. you know. And we all have a beating heart. I haven't met anybody who says, "Oh, generosity sucks," you know. Uh, that oh, we should have a meaner world, you know. Let's have more mean people. Nobody talks like that, you know. Yeah. Like we all want a kinder world. We all want a more compassionate world. And actually, whenever you do an act of kindness, your mind stills. In that stillness, there is a deep sense of interconnection. And in that interconnection, we are fulfilled. There's a sense of contentment. Right? So we all want, like any act, they've done this research at Harvard. They gave strangers money. And they said, you can either spend it on yourself or give it to other people. And everyone's like, yeah, of course, I want to go to a mall and buy, right? And because that's what makes me happy. That's the story we're told, right? That's the spin that all the marketing people have uh, provided Since us. Since I was a kid, that's all yeah, I've been hearing. That's yes. what, yeah, of course you would do that. And even the skeptics, they go out and they actually study the neurobiology uh, and they saw that when even the skeptics go out and give that money to other people, they're happier their neurochemistry changes. And they feel more elated. They feel more connected. So it's, I, I think it's very fundamental to us, not just to me, to all of us, you know, to, be, to be kind and to be generous and to be compassionate. It's in our, as the Dalai Lama has a great quote, um, he says, be selfish, be generous. That it is in your best interest to be generous to other people. Like, I don't think there's like some, wow, you're wired differently. This is just how we're all wired. And there's so much science now that is backing this up. You said it well to a couple of, uh, in, in a couple of your interviews by saying something like, what you do on the outside has a positive impact on the world inside of you. Yeah. I, I think that, that's fantastic stuff. Absolutely. I think we, the big shift we need to do uh, and create in the world is to remember that 
inside matters. You know, that we all, our world is very focused on the outside. And when it's just on the outside, we, we tend to say, oh, inside, that's like some emotions, fluffy stuff, whatever goes on. Well, sure, all that is there, but there's, some, there's so many layers. You can go way deeper where it goes beyond just sentimentality. It's actually the basis of our, uh, of our humanness. Nipun Mehta, it's a great pleasure to have the conversation with you. My Thank pleasure, you Sabri. Can we hug? Oh, yes. <laughs>